Welcome to our last talk of the afternoon <laughs> session. Uh, today we've got Mr. Paul Fenwick in his beautiful hat speaking for us. Paul is the Managing Director of Pearl Trading Australia and has been teaching computer science for over a decade. He is an internationally acclaimed presenter at conferences and user groups worldwide. In his spare time, Paul's interests apparently include security, mycology, cycling, coffee, scuba diving and lexically scoped user pragmata. <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Thank you, everyone. So just a, uh, a quick show of hands for me so I can... Actually, people up the back, can you hear me? Anyone up the back, if you can raise your hands. Okay, great. Um, quick thing for me, just to see what my audience is like. Um, who here has programmed in Perl before? Lots of you. Okay, excellent, excellent. If you haven't programmed in Perl before, this talk might be a little bit technical for you. So just one thing to note, um, this is an extremely condensed talk. So there is a lot of stuff which I promised I would talk about. I have squished all of that into this talk. We are going to be moving fairly quickly. Um, there's a lot more that I would love to be talking about which is not in this talk. Um, so if you happen to be running like a Linux users group or a Perlmongers group or some other sort of users group and you can find a way to get me to your town, I will talk at your users group and I will talk about as much Perl stuff as you are willing to put up with. <laughs> so, so contact me on Twitter if you want to take advantage of that. So you might be looking at this and going, the Perl Renaissance, and the, the, the Perl what? What's this Perl Renaissance thing? So in the last few years, something has happened and uh, Perl has become absolutely, unbelievably, incredibly awesome. <laughs> and for the people for the people out there who are using Perl and all of its awesomeness, it's like, holy crap, this is incredible. And, and everyone's talking about this, except that there's a bit of an echo chamber effect and a lot of the world hasn't actually heard about this yet. So what I'm planning to do is tell you about some of the things in Perl as a Perl programmer, which have made my life much, much easier. Now again, there is a lot more to this which I'd like to mention, but I'm constrained by time. Um, so one of the things, some of the things we have with the Perl Renaissance, uh, we have like these amazing new bits of architecture that we can work with. Um, we have these incredible new layers that I'll show you later on. Um, but one of the great things is that these are very, very accessible to the average person. And if you're wondering, like, how can I get all this stuff? How can I get all the things I'm going to show you? All the stuff I'm going to show you is on the CPAN. Now, the CPAN is the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network. Hopefully, you've all used the CPAN before. And um, the last time I checked, it had a little bit more than 26,000 distributions. So you might hear the whole thing that people talk about where like CPAN is the language and Perl is the shell. That's what we're going to be talking about today, that CPAN is the reason for using Perl. And in fact, if you plot the number of CPAN distributions being released, it's this incredible curve which is going quite exponential. This was actually recorded last year, December uh, 2012. You'll even see there's like a one down here. Things are being released in the future. So, um, so that's how advanced CPAN is. It's definitely not slowing down. And um, if you look at these releases, about half of these releases are completely new modules which are being uploaded. About half of them are existing modules with new releases of those existing modules. Also, I won't go into it too much detail, but if you are using CPAN, you probably want to be using Meta CPAN. It's got all these wonderful new features. You can uh, save things to lists. You can favorite things. You can see what other people's favorites are. Um, there's great APIs. You can click on something. It will clone the source code repository for you straight out of CPAN Meta. Um, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The problem with CPAN, of course, um, is that you have to install modules. And I've worked as a Perl consultant for, for a little bit over a decade now. And the number one problem that people seem to have is installing modules. And it comes down to using this thing called the CPAN shell. Now, I know that, that most of the audience here has used Perl. Who likes the CPAN shell? A, cu a couple of people. Please, questions at the end, because I cannot hear you. So who likes the CPAN shell? A couple of people put up their hands. Who likes it on older versions of Perl? Yeah, OK, without root. It's just insane. If you're using an old version of the CPAN shell, <laughs> It drives you crazy. And the reason why is it starts off with like, hey, do you want to configure the CPAN shell? And it's just like three hours worth of answering questions. And you always get one wrong. Um, so there's this wonderful thing. And I've got up on stage at a conference and hugged Miyagawa, the author of this, called CPAN M. CPAN M or CPAN minus, I kid you not, is better than ice cream. 
I would rather give up ice cream than give up CPAN minus. That's how much I love this tool. And I really like ice cream. So CPAN M works in Perl 5.8 and above. Uh, it's pure Perl, there's no dependencies. It works with local lib, which allows you to install modules locally, and I won't go into all the details here. And it is completely hands off. So if you have CPAN M installed, you want to install a module, you just say, hey, install this. And it's like, sure, OK, I'll go and work on Moose. I'm going to fetch these things down. I'm going to configure it. I'll build and test it. If there's extra things it needs to install, it'll go and grab those. And it says, hey, I'm done. Like, it's really, really, really simple. And it saves you. If you've ever tried installing Moose, there's like 15 million pages of output. It hides all of that in the file for you, because you only really want to see that if things go wrong. So we have a bootstrapping problem here. How do you install CPAN minus? <laughs> Easiest thing ever. You go to a, if you've got a web browser, and hopefully most of you have a web browser on, on some sort of a device, um, you go to that URL and you right click and you say save source. And that's it. That's how you install CPANM. If you don't have a web browser, you can use curl to install it. It's that simple to install CPANM. Or if you want to get fancy, you can do this, which says, hey, CPANM, you figure out how you want to install. I don't know how to use a greater than sign. So it's really, really simple. <laughs> Um, there is cpanm sudo, uh, which does what you expect. It allows you to install things as an administrator, but by default, cpanm installs things as the local user. There's this other thing which you might want to worry about. How do you install Perl? Chances are you're using Perl and everything. You've had, oh, Perl 5.16 point blah is amazing. You go to your machine, it's running 5.8, 5.10, something like that. Um, again, there's this wonderful system called Perlbrew. Perlbrew absolutely blows me away, especially when it comes to testing things against multiple versions of Perl. And I'll show you why. So to begin with, you install Perlbrew using CPAN minus. You say, hey, what's available? It's like, hey, here's all the versions of Perl I know how to install. And so you can go, OK, go and install this. It runs off, it builds it for you, it compiles it, it installs it locally. You don't need to be administrator. You can do like a Perlbrew list. Here's the versions of Perl I happen to have installed. And then if you want to be using a particular version of Perl, you just say Perlbrew use blah. And this is really, really simple. It's like, I want to use this version of Perl. Now I want to use this version of Perl. Now I want to use this version of Perl. So if you want to test if something works under a particular version, you can do so. And it plays nicely with local libs, so you can have different modules installed for different versions of Perl. Um, I'm not showing it in this talk, but there are ways that you can migrate modules between different versions of Perl. It's fantastic. You can turn it off, but my favorite part is Perlbrew exec. Perlbrew exec is super, super, super cool. Because what it lets you do is it lets you run some code under every version of Perl that you have installed. So you can say Perl Brew exec, and then here's something I want to do. Here's like a hello world sort of thing. Now note this doesn't have to be a Perl blah blah blah. You can run any sort of shell command you want there, and it will switch to each version of Perl in succession and run that shell command. So if you want to test, hey, I've written a module, does it work under every version of Perl written in the last 12 years? You can do that in like one command. It's amazing. And you get all this output. So I've shown you how you can install modules. I've shown you how you can install Perl. Let's actually write some damn code. So people have used Perl. Who's written code? All of you. Excellent. Who's written code that you shouldn't have to have written? All of you, exactly. <laughs> Setting version numbers, attaching licenses, boring thing in the world. All those standard tests which you use everywhere, trying to figure out dependencies, uploading things to CPAT. Oh my goodness, I hate this stuff. I absolutely hate having to deal with all this stuff that you do every single time for every single module. Just let me write some damn code. So some of you might have seen Module Starter. Module Starter lets you say, oh, I need to start a module and build you some templates and everything. And it gives you a directory structure that looks like this of which you care about exactly one file, which is the one where you actually want to put your code in. And everything else is sort of this stuff that you have to maintain. And it's nice that it built it for you, but it would be nice if you didn't have to touch it at all. So if you are a serious Perl author, there is this amazing thing called distzilla. And distzilla, as described in its documentation, is maximum overkill for Perl authors. And I kid you not, it is amazing what this thing can do. Dzil.org if you want to look at what's going on. So the first time you run it, you run Dzil setup. I'm not going to go through all that. You answer some questions. And then you say, please make me a new module. Dzil new my module. And what you end up now is with exactly two files. One of those files is a dist.ini, which describes what your distribution is and how it works. And Dzil makes that for you. And the other one is your module. 
There are no tests in there, there are no readmes, there's no manifest files, there's no make files, there's none of this other sort of stuff, because Diesel makes all of that for you. So when you type Diesel build, that will actually build your distribution. It makes a subdirectory, it puts in all that stuff that you expect, but you don't have to maintain it anymore. You do a Diesel test and it runs all the tests for you. You do a Diesel release, it runs all the tests for you and all the author tests and all the release tests and it uploads it to the CPAN for you. Now, at this point, you might be saying, okay, sure, that's kind of cool, but, but so what? You know, maybe I don't really care about having to maintain those extra files. Well, the cool thing about Diesel is it's a pluggable architecture. So you can plug extra things into it. So here's your sort of basic file and everything. Name, author, license, blah, 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 blah. You know, this is at basic thing down the bottom. But I can say, hey, I'd really like you to be aware of Git. And so now, it'll say whenever you do a release, it will tag that in Git for you. It'll also make sure that you can't do a release unless all of your files have been checked in. If you have uncommitted code, you can't do a release. You can do things like, hey, figure out my prerequisites for me, because I don't want to have to do that myself. Or please update my package versions for me. Or please use Perl Test Critic, which I'll show you later. Or please write my pod for me. This is absolutely wonderful. There tends to be all this boilerplate pod that you write everywhere of here's how you ask for support, here's how you submit bugs, here's how you do all these other things. This is absolutely fantastic and it actually extends pod to make your life much, much easier. What's even better is if you're using Diesel, all of these things require you to install extra modules. You can just say, hey, figure out what extra modules I need to install and pipe that to CPanM and it installs them all for you. All of, your, all of your distribution requirements, all of your testing requirements, all of your build requirements builds everything, which is wonderful. So <clears throat> let's look at some more code. Let's look at object-oriented Perl. Um, just a, a quick show of hands here. Who here has used object-oriented Perl? Some of you. Okay. So as you know, out of the box, OO Perl is not awesome. <laughs> It's not even close to being awesome. And, and if you sort of grew up in the dark ages of how people were trying to figure out what OO should be in Perl, it was just way too flexible. <laughs> there were just like too many ways to do it. Uh, most of them were wrong, um, or they were stupid, or they were both. <laughs> and so this, this really was like this terrible dark ages, and we now have the Perl Renaissance, so we're out of the dark ages, but during the dark ages, OO Perl was absolutely awful, and the rest were too hard. And, and OO used to feel like it was just bolted on the side of Perl. Like Perl version 5 came out, and it was just like, what the hell, guys, you've just tacked this thing on the side. So as you know, the Perl motto is there's more than one way to do it, which is pronounced Tim Toady. Um, I'm going to show you Moose, which I'm expecting a lot of you have seen already, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, the Moose motto is there's more than one way to do it, but sometimes consistency is not a bad thing either. <laughs> and of course, that is pronounced Tim Toady bicarbonate. <laughs> so how do we install Moose? How do we use Moose? Well, here, my, here I've got a class, you know, same way I do a class in normal OO Perl, package blah, use Moose. Um, here's how I do attributes. I was really surprised the other day when I used Java, and like all these things which I just expect would magically happen in, Juice, in Moose didn't actually happen in Java, so I'm feeling pretty good about this. Anyway, here I've got some attributes, user surname, given username. Um, here's what type of attributes they are in terms of are they read-write or are they read-only, and I can also give them types. So in this case, they're all strings, but I'll show you some more complicated types in a moment. That is my entire class. I don't have to write any constructors, I don't have to write any methods, I don't have to do anything else. That is my entire class for a simple class like this. To make myself a new object, I simply say, hacker goes to new, here are some details, it all works. It makes sure that all of those fields are filled in, they're the right thing, etc., etc. If I want to access those, my username is hacker goes to username. So I've got setters, I've got getters, I've got object construction all out of the box. So let's say that we want to extend this class. Let's say we want to have uh, hackers who can talk to each other. So I'm going to have a hacker social. Um, to do that, we extend hacker. So I'm going to be basing myself off an existing class. How do hackers talk to each other? By email, of course. So I'm going to have an email attribute. And that's all I have to do for my new class here. Now I can provide an email address, and I can change the email address. Now there's a huge, huge problem with this. My email address at the moment is just a string and I would like to validate my email addresses. And this is where Moose starts to become really cool. Because Moose has this idea of type constraints. 
So you can have types like strings and numbers and so on and so forth, and you can write your own. So I'm going to use the existing regex common module, which knows how to uh, parse email addresses and verify email addresses. And then I'm going to say that there is a subtype called email, which is a string, and it's considered valid where it matches the regular expression which I've got up there. So this is a very, very simple way of saying, make sure it's a valid regular expression, otherwise there's a message I provide. Now when I write my code, I say that it has an email, it is read-write, and it is an email type. And now whenever anything's put in there, it gets type-checked by Moose to make sure that's a valid email address. And if it's not, you end up throwing an exception and you can go and use that. So that's pretty good for setting up attributes. Of course, eventually you'll want to write some methods. So how do I write a method in Moose? Well, you know, I write myself a subroutine and I say myself, which is the first thing that comes in as the object, and then my arguments come in and so on and so forth. And, and just hang on a second. What's that? At underscore. Who here knows what at underscore does? Okay, it's, it, at underscore is like the list of arguments to your subroutine. It is my most hated Perl variable. Like every other language in the world has a proper way of passing in arguments. Perl is like, here's a list. <laughs> What's more, it's at a really ugly variable name. Like, what the fuck? You have all this stuff with Moose. It's like, this is like the best object system I've ever worked with, and now I have to touch at underscore. Like, seriously, what is wrong with this? It's like, you know, the Stone Age called, and they want their method signatures back. It's just, <laughs> gah. So, I'm going to show you uh, MooseX method signatures. Um, I know that some members of the audience have strong opinions as to which uh, module should be used for signatures. Really so I, slow. I, I, as Schwerner's pointing out, this is apparently slow. Um, I have not noticed. I've been using this in production code for like the last two years. I haven't noticed it being slow. Um, but apparently there are faster mo modules. I'll mention some in a moment. So I'm going to show you a real-world example um, from the Beeminder APIs. Um, some of you I might have spoken to Beeminder about. Um, in a nutshell, it's a way of having uh, these pretty little graphs. These are online. Uh, I can uh, track things like my dance lessons or my inbox size or when I floss my teeth. Um, and I can actually have this goal. Here I have to keep below that yellow line. And if I don't keep below that yellow line, I get fined money. So it's a very motivating way for me to like, make sure that my inbox is kept under control. So the Perl module which lets you work with this is, is Web Service Beeminder, um, and it uses MooseX method signatures, and this is actual code from the module. So first of all, rather than having to write sub, I can write method. It makes it very clear, this is a method at data point. And then, like every other language in the world, we can say here are some parameters that you pass in. So here I've got a string, and I've got a number which I'm passing in, my goal and my value, they're required. If you're wondering what the funny syntax there is, the colons say that these are named parameters. So I'll show you an example in a moment. The exclamation marks say that they have to be there. They're required parameters. Here I've got a timestamp. The timestamp is optional. If you don't provide a timestamp, it defaults to now. And likewise, I'm going to have a, a string and I'm going to have a Boolean value. Should I send the user some email about this? And then I've got some code. I don't actually have frognicate inside the actual module code. This is just to give you an example. So I set a default timestamp and away I go there. Notice here that all of these have great names. So that's called goal and timestamp and so on and so forth. The way in which I call that looks like this. There's my goal, there's my value, there's my comment, so on and so forth. So the named parameters which I pass in match those variable names which I've got. It's really, really easy to see what's going on. So that's how I floss my teeth. I run that little piece of code snippet. Now, of course, there is, happens to be a bug in this. Um, the bug is that uh, Perl Boolean values tend to be these true falses. Um, so one is a true value in Perl, zero is a false value in Perl. Uh, the Beeminder API actually wants strings, true and false. Now, it's going to be an obvious and easy source of bugs if my users have to write true and false when they've come from Perl land, they're used to writing one and zero. So what I can do is I can define a subtype. So a subtype of a Bool is a string which can only be true or false. It can only be those two values. And then, and this is this really cool part, I can say I can coerce a B bool from a bool by looking at the value, and if it's true, I use the value true, otherwise I use the value false. And likewise, I can coerce a Perl Boolean value from a B bool by looking at it and saying, is it equal to true? So now I have a way of converting between Perl's sort of inbuilt idea of true and false and Bminder's API 
uh, idea of true and false. And now the only change I need to do with this little flag here is to say, rather than having a bool, I've got a b bool. And my b bool is send mail is equal to false, and I say does coerce. And the does coerce says, if you pass me in a one, I'm going to coerce that to the string true. And if you pass me in a zero, I'm going to coerce that to the string false. And the default value, of course, is false. So um, this is fantastic. One place that you see this all the time is when can, uh, working with dates. So you'll have something in like a nice ISO format. You want to turn it into a date time object. That stuff is really, really easy to do with type conversions and type coercions. That's part of Moose. So um, the other thing which I want to show you um, are regular expressions. Oh, hang on a second. I should also say um, method signatures. Uh, did I get that right, Schwan? Yep. Method signatures apparently lets you do the same thing, but faster. I have not used it way faster. So I've not used it myself. Um, but we do have a member of the audience here who is accepting uh, bug reports and patches if you find any problems with it. So regular expressions. Um, Perl 510 regular expressions are amazing, and I love them, and I want to show some, to, some of them to you now. So this is a scary regular expression. Um, this is actually out of some of our course notes. And, and this regular expression here isn't actually that scary, because if you look at each part of it, it's not that hard. It's like, OK, I know that this here is a sequence of, of, uh, of, of space characters. Um, this here is a sequence of digits and colons, and we're remembering them. Each part of that is easy to understand. But as a whole, you look at this and you just go, oh, god. You know, do I have to debug this thing? If you're lucky, your person who has written this has actually written it like this. So what have I done here? This works like all the way back to Perl 5.6. I put a little X switch on the end. That gives me an extended regular expression. It means that I can add comments and spaces to my regular expression. So that's easy to see what's going on. I can see here, I'm like parsing the output of ls minus l. So this is good until you start asking questions like, what's my file size? If you know how regular expressions in Perl work, they store their captures in these special variables called $1, $2, $3, So to figure out what your size is, you need to go back and, and count parentheses. But what happens if your parentheses change? What happens if we go from this to this, where suddenly you have some sort of preamble at the top there that could contain parentheses inside that string. You have no idea what the numbering is for the rest of your, uh, your matches there, the rest of your parentheses. So if you're using Perl 5.10, wonderful, wonderful invention here, Perl 5.10 to the rescue, named captures. So what you can now do is say, I'm going to have parentheses, and I'm going to call this permissions, or links, or user. Notice I no longer have comments on the right-hand side, because I don't need them anymore. I now have beautiful self-documenting code. And now if I ask myself, well, what's the file name? I know what that is. It's in the file name variable. This is a funny looking syntax, dollar plus curly brackets file name. It's what was matching in that file name capture. Or what is the size happening, happens to be. The great thing about this is it gets, oops, is it gets even better um, because I can do things like this. I can write little snippets. I can say a title is going to be one of these strings and store that into the capture called title. And a name happens to be a sequence of word characters, and store that into a capture called name. And then when I'm doing a, uh, a regular expression match, I can look for dear title and name. So I'm now referring to things in a semantic context. I can now refer to things by this is what they mean. And then I can look things up. Give me the title, give me the name. And once you start doing this, it becomes much, much, much easier to write and understand regular expressions. It also becomes way easier to test them, because you start writing these little fragments, and then you run your tests against those fragments. So you can be very sure that I know that this matches an IP address, or this matches something else. In terms of cool regular expression stuff, though, we now also have a regular expression debugger. Now, if you thought that things could be scary in Perl, this is a complete regex debugger that runs inside the regex engine and it actually allows you to do things like run the regex engine backwards. So, so this is amazing. This, anyone here who knows Damien Conway, this is Damien's module. Um, you can actually invoke that by using this command rxrx. So you type rxrx, what name of your Perl program, and it starts it with the regular expression debugger. So I'm going to be very brave here. I'm going to run a live demo, and we will see if this works. Um, let me just zip over to here. And OK. So here I'm running RxRx, 
Um, and all I've done here, and I'll actually uh, uh, exit out of this. Oops. Wah, no, don't do that. OK, live demos are great. So all I've done here is RxRx, my little program, and some data for it. So here I am. Um, I'm going to skip this first line because it's pretty boring, and I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, so here I've got my data, and you can see here it says, I'm starting my regex match, and I can go, OK, let's step forward. And it says, I'm testing to see if I'm at the start of the string or line. And sure enough, I am. So it says that passed, assertion satisfied. Then it says I'm capturing to dollar one and also two permissions. Okay. Now it says I'm trying character class one or more times as many as possible. And it says, hey, guess what? That matched. And then you'll see this awesome thing. It tells me what's inside dollar one. Now I'm at the end of dollar one. Now I'm trying to match it with some white space characters. That worked. Now I'm trying to capture dollar two. I'm trying a digit one or more times. That matched and everything. Hey, here's what's inside dollar two. So I can actually walk through my regular expressions and see why they are matching. I could even do like awesome things like, hey, show me how they're matching in JSON format. <laughs> why? Because you might want to actually dump this sort of thing out to see how long are your regular expressions taking, how many steps are they taking, you might want to pass this into something else, or you might want to like reload this and, and sort of rerun a regular expression match. So you can do really cool things there. Uh, you can do heat matches. You can actually see how long does it spend in certain parts of the regular expression. That's really useful if you've got something with lots of backtracking. If it backtracks over something lots and lots of times, that will show up bright reds and yellows, and you can spot that really quickly. So RxRx, do grab it. It's absolutely amazing. Incredible, incredible piece of code. I can't spend too long on that, though, so I'm going to get back to This is the problem with live demos. I've got two live demos here. Excellent. So I'm going to get back to here and talk to you about web development. Now, for some reason, whenever we talk about web development in Perl, uh, we're obligated to mention these three letters, um, to which my response is, that's pain. Never, <laughs> ever, ever touch that. So, Perl now has these amazing frameworks, Catalyst, Gifty, CGI application, Mojalicious, all these other sorts of things, which are apparently amazing frameworks to develop your, uh, your applications in. However, none of them match my attention span. <laughs> Based upon a, a popular uh, social networking site that I've used for the last couple of years, my attention span is now limited to 140 characters or less. <laughs> And the only thing which I have found which allows me to write a complete web server in Perl in 140 characters or less with enough space for hashtags at the end, which work because they're comments in Perl, is Dancer. So how do I use Dancer? Dancer is, oh my goodness, amazing. <coughs> Here is the Hello World program in Dancer, complete program. Step one, use the module. Step two, when you're getting the root directory, run this piece of code. Step three, do whatever it is that you need to do to start this web server. That's it. That's my entire hello world. I then run that, run hello.pl, and it says, oh, hey, you're running this thing. Let me start up a development server on port 3000 for you. So now you're actually running this on your local machine on port 3000. You can just go. And if you start you know, using this application, you'll start seeing messages here, what's going on. You can get debug messages. You can pop them out to a file, so on and so forth. Um, if you don't want to use an actual web browser, there I am using wget, it gives me back hello world. Pretty sweet. Um, so what else can I do here? If I don't want to see a hello world, I can do a hello user. So here I've said, whenever I see the path user, followed by colon name. Colon name can be any part of the URL it wants to be. And what I can do is access that via the parameter name. And then I can say, hello name. So if you go to slash user slash Paul, it says, hello Paul. What's even better is I can run this through a template. So rather than just returning a straight piece of, uh, uh, of string, like a, a text plane, I can return a template. And by default, I'm using a template toolkit, but you can plug any sort of template you want in there as well. I even heard of one person able to use PHP as a templating language inside Dancer. So you, you can do that, yeah. You can also use regular expressions inside your strings. So here I've done get account, and then give me a user, which has to consist of word characters, letters, numbers, and underscores, and then give me an ID, which has to consist of digits. And so Dancer, make sure that that is a valid URL that's being passed in. You can then extract those uh, captures using the captures subroutine. Then I can plug them into a template, do whatever else I want. Other nifty things I've seen people do this with, um, anything which starts with a demo, 
for example, I'm going to change to a demo database. So I've got something somewhere which is connected to a database. I'm going to switch over to a demo database, and then I'm going to use an internal redirect, a forward, to the actual article's URL that would normally be called with the parameter that I've given there. So you can actually do things where it's like based upon some leading path, you can do this. You can put hooks in to say before you access any URL, you've got to do this. So if you're not logged in, you go to the login path. And this is beautiful for me because I find myself writing all these web services. I can say, hey, when I return a Perl data structure, serialize that into JSON for me and just hand that back. So I'm writing all these applications these days which aren't really working directly with clients. They're, they're working with applications that want back JSON. And it's super, super easy. Return a hash reference. Here's some JSON. So that's PerlDancer.org. Um, there's also, whilst we're talking about the web things, there is Plaque. Who here has used Plaque? Yes! Okay, you are going to love this. I might run a little bit over time, but it's going to be so exciting it's worth it. <laughs> so, Plaque is the ultimate glue layer. Absolutely amazing. Everything plugs into Plaque. So if you're using CGI or Mason or Dancer or Catalyst or all those sorts of things, all of your web development things in Perl, they all plug into Plaque. And all of your servers, your Mod CGI and Fast CGI and Nginx and Starman and Lighty and all those things, they all plug into Plaque as well. So this here sits between your application and your web server. You can also have it be your own web server if you want. So the exact same application I had before, that Hello World application, I'm now running under Plaque by simply saying Plaque up hello.pl. I says, OK, I'm now running a Plaque server. I'm accepting things on port 5000. And you might say, yeah, OK, so, so what? You know, maybe this is going to make my life a little bit easier because I don't have to try and figure out how to get this to work with that server over there. Um, the big thing about Plaque, though, is it allows you to plug in middlewares. So let's say that you want to compress your output. It's a fairly common thing. You shouldn't be doing it in your application. You can just have that as a Plaque layer. You can do things like caching in your Plaque layer. You can do things like e-tags and authentication. And the great thing about this is you can add these things to any Perl application with no application code changes necessary. In fact, um, here is a config file uh, that you can plug straight into Dancer, which is I want to turn on compression, that's my deflator, and I also want to turn on a debug module which has all of these panels. And again, I'm going to do a live demo, which I utterly adore. So over here, I have Triller. So Triller is a Twitter clone um, that I wrote one day because I wanted to. Um, it's very, very, very simple. And you'll see here on the right-hand side, I've got this little box, this little panel. That panel has been dynamically injected using JavaScript by Plaque. So my underlying application has no idea that this exists. Plaque has simply said, oh, you're serving an HTML page. Let me add this for you. So you can drop that out. And what I can do here is I can say, what's the environment that my server was running under? And I can see that. I can see what was the response that I happened to have. I can see how long did this take. I can see how much memory did I use. And also, what's the difference in memory since the last request? So it's really easy to see, do I have a memory leak? How am I memory leaking? Or what sort of requests am I doing? You can also do things like this. These are all of my SQL statements. These are all of my database calls, which have all been traced out. So I can see what's happening on that database level. Um, also here, I've got my Dancer version, I've got my Dancer settings, so I can see how Dancer is configured, so on and so forth. So this is something which I do not have to change my application for. It's built into, into Plaque. It's something I can just turn on in Plaque. But I can also like, add extra things to that. I can write my application, which can then add extra panels to this. It's absolutely fantastic. So Plaque is just amazing to work with. So back over to the main demonstration. I have five minutes left before, less than five minutes left, before I have questions. So the last thing I want to talk about is code review, super quickly. Um, excuse me one second. Why are you not? Yes, excellent, code review. So the last thing I want to talk about is code review. Um, there's this great little book that was published a number of years ago now called Pearl Best Practices. Um, and if you happen to have that lying around, it's a really good read. It's going to teach you lots and lots of cool stuff. Um, but what happens if you're too lazy to read Pearl Best Practices? Um, also, ideally, code review is you get someone else to review your code. But what happens if you don't have someone else around to do that? Well, there is this totally awesome module called Pearl Critic. 
that some of you might have used, um, Perl Critic has read Perl best practices. <laughs> so what you can do is you can just go, I just want to like, just check my code, see if it's okay. So it's a command line tool. Um, I happen to be responsible for the world's fastest Minesweeper bot um, because I got like, tired of playing Minesweeper all day, so I wrote a bot to do it for me. Um, <laughs> so I can run perlcriticsweeper.pm. And uh, what it will do is it say, okay, I'm running that, and it says, hey, that looks okay. Now, the reason it says it looks okay is because by default, Perl Critic is very, very gentle with you. It's only if it sees you do something that's just a really bad idea does it complain. So you can say, okay, I want you to be stern. <laughs> so Perl Critic stern, and it says, okay, I've come back with all of these things. And you'll notice what I've got here is Pragma blah, 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 see page 55 of Perl Best Practices. So if you have the book there on your desk, you can turn it open and see what's going on. You can see, you know, blah, 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 see pages 81 and 82 of Perlbeth's practices. So it's pretty cool. There's actually an uh, escalating number of levels <laughs> that you can run it with. Um, I generally aim at harsh. Anything above harsh, well, it's cruel or it's brutal. So, you know, I try to go for harsh. What happens if you don't have Perlbeth's practices? Well, you can say, I want it to be verbose. Verbose 10 will give you the community written uh, contributions, the community written descriptions as why you're doing whatever you're doing is a bad idea. So here I've done the same thing with Verbose 10 and it gives me these you know, nice big explanations which I can read. So I don't even need to have a copy of the book. And you're like, okay, sure, it's complaining about this constant pragma, but you know, I happen to like the constant pragma. Perlbeth's practices recommends that you use the read-only pragma. I use uh, the constant pragma in some of my modules to do conditional compilation. So they run different code based upon your operating system. So what I can do is I can say, actually, I am going to exclude that particular rule. So it's like, give me all the warnings except for that one. Now, of course, at this point, I've got too many options. So what you can do is you can pop all of this into a Perl Critic RC file. And it might be a little bit hard to read up there, but it's exactly what I'd write on the command line. So severity equals stern, verbose equals 10, exclude these things. Then run my code and it says, you know, here's what you're doing good and here's what you're doing bad. Great things about Perl Critic, you can have a copy in your home directory, which is what's going to be used by default. So this can be your particular coding standard and you can use it. However, you can also have them in a Perl project directory. So I'm going to download someone else's code, they've got a Perl Critic RC file, that gives me the coding standards for their project, which might be different from my personal coding standards, and it will use the right one. So this is absolutely fantastic when you're working with teams of people. You can also test everything. Please run everything uh, in my lib directory. It recurses through it all, tests everything there. Um, there's a test module for it, so you can automate this sort of thing. Uh, there's a plugin for Diesel. You can change existing rules. You can write your own rules. And you can even test online. So if you go to perlcritic.com, you can actually plug in your Perl code there. Um, please make sure it's not sensitive Perl code. This is like transmitted in the clear over the internet. Um, but it will come back with, uh, with critique on your code. So you might be wondering now, and I know that I'm out of time, so I've timed this perfectly. You might be wondering, where do you go now? How can you learn more about the amazing, awesome things in Perl? Um, the big thing which I'd recommend is Task Kensho. Um, Task Kensho is a collection of the best of the best of these sort of modern or enlightened Perl modules which are on the CPAN. Um, if you're on Windows and you install Do What I Mean Perl, it actually gives you all of Task Kensho out of the box, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, there is also a blog at modernpearlbooks.com, which I'd also recommend. That it also talks about things which are happening with the latest and greatest modern pearl stuff. So hopefully with this and with those URLs and with the questions you're about to ask me in the Q&A, you can all enjoy the Pearl Renaissance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah.